PhD and a great colleague. Linda will talk about the fluency matter across linguistics of the role of fluency in reading comprehension and spelling. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here and I want to thank all of the organizers of this conference. Uh, it's been, so far, it's been a very informative and interesting two days, and I hope that the third day will live up to the standards of the first two. <laughs> so this is a study of the role of fluency in reading comprehension and spelling in four languages, and I happen to be an expert in doing research in languages that I don't speak. So for those of you who want a flavor uh, of Swedish, Croatian, or Estonian, that's what, if I could pronounce it, that's what good morning would look like in those languages. <coughs> so the uh, definition of fluency, the conceptualization of fluency that we used in this study was reading isolated words or pseudo words in a fixed time. In the case of this study, it was uh, 45 seconds. So the independent variable was uh, how many words or pseudo words that um, the child could read in 45 seconds. There are other definitions of fluency that are more related to text. Uh, one of the reasons that we didn't use this kind of measure is that uh, if a child makes an error early in the text that influences the reading that happens, and I think that the accuracy uh, may be a problem in that situation. So, before I started this work, I was what one might call a fluency skeptic. Um, Zvia will know that we've had some um, discussions about fluency. I thought that fluency was relatively unimportant compared to accuracy. And I know now that I was a bit biased by my experiences with English. I've uh, listened to many dyslexics read. And in English, the issue is actually accuracy. That um, the uh, graphing phoneme correspondences are complicated. It's a very, very large vocabulary in the English language, um, 600,000 words, which is much greater than uh, any other language. So the combination of the uh, phonological requirements and the uh, semantic requirements makes English quite a different language um, than others. And accuracy is a, was uh, a very good independent variable for measuring reading skills. But um, I, I think many others, especially those of, who work, those of us who work in English, ignored um, <coughs> fluency as a variable. And I realize now that it is a very good measure of word retrieval. So it's more than just reading skills. There's actual retrieval of the words that's involved. And also, working um, fluency is a measure of working memory because there's decoding and retrieval that's involved and it's, a, it's actually um, a working memory task. So fluency is more complicated, I think, than accuracy and perhaps uh, one of the purposes of this study was to investigate um, the role of fluency 
in languages which vary in some interesting ways, which I will describe. Um, so the languages in question vary in the predictability of uh, graphing phoneme correspondences. I think we're all familiar with that concept. They also variation, vary in syntactic complexity and also in word length. And all of these variables may um, influence word retrieval. So the participants in this study in the four languages uh, were both what we call dyslexics, who were at the lowest 20th percentile um, for accuracy on uh, a word reading test. And we compared them with what we call typical readers were between the 40th and the 75th percentile on the same word reading test. So in Canada, formal reading instruction starts in grade one at the age of six. In the other countries, formal reading instruction starts a year later. So what we did was to compare um, grade two students from Canada, they're about seven years old, and uh, in um, Sweden, Croatia, and Estonia, the students uh, were in grade three and four. So they had had approximately the same amount of instruction in reading. So the languages varied in the predictability of letter sound correspondences. Uh, English, the estimates vary, but it's about 50%. Uh, in Swedish, it's about 75%, and in Estonian and Croatian, it's virtually 100%. There are some uh, words that they borrowed um, from other languages, and those don't exactly follow the correspondences, but basically, um, they're uh, quite regular and predictable. However, um, these languages differ in interesting ways in the complexity of the grammar. Now, real linguists don't um, agree with the concept of grammatical complexity. They say each language has its own features and you can't really compare languages. But I think we heard um, from Miko about the Finnish language and I think all of us um, would agree that that's a lot more complex than English in terms of the syntactic structure. And Estonian is very similar to Finnish in its uh, syntactic structure. So um, just for an example, English has no cases, Swedish has four cases, Croatian has seven cases, and Estonian has 14 cases. You may remember that Finnish had 15 cases, um, so it, it's perhaps even more complex than <laughs> Estonian, but uh, certainly compared to English, it's a very different kind of syntactic structure. So this is what this one sentence looks like in the four different languages. And what um, I didn't have room to show is that for both um, Estonian and Croatian, word order is not very important. And these sentences uh, in those two languages could have been written in three or four different word orders, and the meaning would have been the same. In English and Swedish, um, the word order is rather inflexible and there really wouldn't be an alternative word order for writing those sentences. And um, like Finnish you saw yesterday, there are these uh, double either consonants or vowels that are pronounced differently from the single um, version of it. So that's a level, I think, of phonological complexity, um, which is not in terms of grapheme phoneme correspondences, but it's still um, a, uh, an important variable. So this is an example of 
English if you need to be convinced about the unpredictability of it. This is the um, initial GI in the word, and um, it's pronounced two different ways. We say giraffe instead of giraffe, um, I'm sorry, instead of giraffe, um, and I, I don't know why it has something to do with the origin of the word. Um, now, the word at the bottom of the list, um, probably many of you will know, it's pronounced gigolo. Well, when uh, my sister and I were on a car trip with my parents, um, she was six and I was eight, we passed a theater marquee, marquee and my uh, sister asked my parents, what's a gigolo? And which of course is a reasonable assumption of it. And um, my parents came close to having an accident trying to describe to a six-year-old what a, what a gigolo was. So, uh, and my sister and I remember the incident, but we don't remember what our mother said. Um, so this is um, a word some of you have probably seen it before. I saw it for the first time three years ago, and it was in a context, so I understood the meaning of it, but um, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh, so there were, as far as my brain was concerned, two possible pronunciations. Um, the vowel, the first vowel could be a short sound or it could be a long sound. So I went with the incorrect pronunci pronunciation, which was um, splenium. The correct pronunciation is splenium. And, um, but that's the kind of dilemma that English uh, presents. Uh, it, the context was that I was doing some uh, work, um, DTI work with um, some colleagues, uh, and this particular area, the splenium, um, turned out to be uh, quite important in reading and specific to reading. So these particular white matter tracts. So um, it's, uh, it's an important word. And um, I was corrected immediately when I, when I said it incorrectly. But here again is the, uh, the dilemma of English. So we saw a little bit about um, Finnish. And these languages um, obviously vary in uh, inflectional complexity. Um, English and Swedish, relatively few, few inflections. Uh, by the way, I just used the noun book. Uh, book is a verb in English, but um, we were just talking, talking about noun inflections. So um, this is what it looks like. Now, this is an interesting. Uh, reading task because there are all these possibilities. Uh, but I think it's also relevant to syntactic skills and I'll talk about that uh, shortly. So the reading tasks that we used were um, a word reading task, a pseudo word reading task, and a reading comprehension task in these three languages. Okay. And the fluency measure that we used are, uh, was, there were uh, two of them reading words or reading pseudo words, the number of words you could read in 45 seconds. So I looked at these four languages um, from a variety of perspectives of the variables that we think might influence uh, reading comprehension. First is phonological awareness or um, 
related to decoding. So what's the complexity of the decoding process? And therefore, we predict that phonological awareness would be more important in English and to some extent in Swedish than in the other languages. But syntactic awareness, I think, is critical for reading comprehension. Because in order to read quickly and efficiently, you need to make predictions about the words that come next in the sentence. Um, so it's not something you're aware of, but uh, it's something that will um, facilitate the reading process. So the um, Estonian and Croatian obviously um, are more uh, complex in terms of the syntactic awareness that's required. So one might predict that that would be a more important variable in those languages. And working memory is important in reading because you have to process incoming uh, information and remember what it is that you've already read. So you have to remember the beginning of the sentence when you're reading the end of a sentence. You have to remember uh, the beginning of a paragraph um, when you're trying to understand the end of it. So um, I uh, asked the question of these variables um, and how does fluency, uh, where does it fit in the hierarchy of these variables? So um, I was predicting that these other variables might be more important than fluency. Um, so we measured phonological awareness in these four different languages with a phoneme deletion task. And uh, it wasn't just the initial uh, phoneme, it was sometimes a phoneme in the middle of a word, which makes it a more complex phonological awareness task. So we did not get ceiling effects. The oral close task is where we said a sentence, there would be a word missing in the sentence, and the child would have to supply the missing word. So here's an example in English. Um, and I'm going to say beep when there's a missing word. Dad beep Bobby a letter yesterday. So obviously it has to be uh, a past tense. And as it turns out, um, many past tenses in English of words that you might use in that sentence are irregular, um, like uh, gave, sent, so this is a more, this is a difficult sentence sometimes for children, especially those who have difficulties uh, in syntactic awareness. So these are just some examples of the sentences. Uh, now it's about eight or nine years ago, we had uh, a six-year-old, not in this study, uh, say to us, uh, Dad emailed Bobby a letter yesterday. Now, working memory, I said, is you have to process incoming information and remember uh, what it is that you've heard before, and you have to draw on syntactic and phonological skills. So it's a complex task. Now, the way we measure this in the four languages, uh, this is an example. Um, so we would say uh, a sentence. The child has, would have to fill in a word that made sense at the end of the sentence. And then after hearing all four sentences, uh, repeat the words in the order that they said them. Now we started off, there were only two sentences, and there were three examples of two sentences, and then um, three sentences, four sentences, and five sentences. Um, so we thought that this was analogous to the reading process. So the, the results. Um, the dyslexics in all the languages compared to the typical readers had um, significantly lower scores in all of these areas. So um, that all of these variables um, are important in reading. But the question for us um, was, it, was there a higher hierarchy? Were some of these more important than others? So 
Um, first of all, these are the correlations between um, fluency, this is word reading fluency, and reading comprehension in the four languages. It's very similar. The correlations range from 0.5 to 0.7. Um, in all the languages. Um, the same was true of spelling there between 0.5 and 0.6, the correlations of word fluency and spelling. But uh, we compared directly word fluency and word accuracy in each of these languages in relationship to reading comprehension. And in all four languages, word fluency was more important, <coughs> word reading fluency was more important than word reading accuracy. Um, it wasn't always a great deal more important, but um, the pattern was very similar. So, uh, Svia should have won the argument um, a number of years ago. Okay. Um, then if we put all of these variables in uh, multiple regression to see whether how fluency compared to the other variables. Um, uh, and in the case of pseudo word reading, in English and Swedish, pseudo word fluency was more important than the oral close test, than the uh, syntactic awareness task. And we saw the um, relative unpredictability of uh, graphing phoneme correspondences in those languages. But the results were different for um, Croatian and Estonian, where the oral closed task, um, because of the uh, complex syntactic complexity of those languages, um, the oral closed task was a better predictor of reading comprehension than pseudo word fluency. So this is what the regressions look like with all of those variables. Um, and these are the, this is the R squared, so the percentage of variance accounted for. Very similar in the four languages. But in all the languages except Estonian, fluency was more important. Um, in Estonian, the oral close was more important. Um, so. Uh, that is not surprising considering the uh, complexity of the syntactic structure. Uh, and it was very similar results for spelling, where um, fluency, word reading fluency, was the most important in all the languages except Estonian, where um, the oral closed task was more important. Um, In all languages, when we compared fluency to accuracy, uh, in terms of spelling, fluency was more important than spelling. And I think both in spelling and reading, I think fluency is actually um, a measure of a number of things. But I think it draws on, as I said, uh, word retrieval, but also um, working memory. And obviously, for spelling, um, that is uh, uh, an important, those are important skills. Uh, and again, with spelling, we saw this, we see the same pattern. Pseudo word fluency is more highly correlated with spelling than any of the other processes, except um, in Estonian when again the syntactic awareness variable was um, the better predictor of spelling. So um, I've become a, a fluency convert. Um, fluency is really quite important. Now, one of the reasons, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, the children in um, this study um, were young at the relatively beginning stages of reading. And I thought that um, fluency <coughs> would not matter as much at the beginning stages of reading. Um, but again, I think that was wrong. Uh, and maybe uh, Orly will tell us a little bit more about that. 
that um, it is, uh, it's important. And these other variables are important also. And I was listening, as I was listening to all of the studies um, of brain processing, uh, of brain processes in reading, I wonder about, um, I don't know of any studies uh, of these other processes and what happens in the brain when we're actually um, doing a, a, a task that requires an understanding of syntactic awareness or working, verbal working memory. Um, are these related areas? Is it in the same place that the reading occurs? So I will leave that question uh, to my colleagues who work in the area. Um, and I think also, I think we tend to neglect spelling but the, there are some very complex processes that are required in spelling. And you saw in Finnish what could be the length of the words. I think the words in Estonian are not quite as long as the Finnish words. And I think the everyday, uh, in everyday language, they probably are not um, quite as long as uh, with um, what uh, a thousand possible endings, but um, it's uh, it's the um, actual grammatical function of the word and the grammatical complexity of the word um, may be um, quite important. And I also think, in terms of working with developing reading and spelling skills, especially the higher level reading comprehension skills, that there are um, other variables that um, we haven't really studied. Uh, I think the work, we've heard some of the work and there will be some more work in, uh, in fluency, training fluency and the effect that that has on reading comprehension. But I think the other processes um, also are important to study. So um, I'm going to end with a commercial. Um, I have just written a book called Understanding Dyslexia and Other Learning Disabilities. And uh, the brochures have all disappeared. But uh, it's also available locally in uh, some bookstores in Israel. And if anybody's interested, I can give them information about that. Um, but thank you very much in all these languages, and I will not um, bother with the uh, pronunciation of these. Oh, and one more thing. I forgot in the beginning to thank um, my colleagues who have uh, been very uh, important in doing this research. Uh, uh, Gordana Karatesh um, from Croatia, um, uh, Marika Evison from Estonia and Thomas Juice and uh, Erlen uh, Jamquist from Sweden. Thank you. Um, this was, it was the, these trends, um, the question was, would these be true just uh, only of the poor readers? No, these correlations were for the total group, but it was very similar for both groups. Um, so I think the very similar processes operate. Um, they, of course, on um, all of these, uh, they were selected in word reading to be non-overlapping. But um, they were, there was very little overlap in the other. And these are, I think, all of these are critical processes. Yes. I just wanted to know, how did you uh, measure spelling? Ah, um, uh, the question was, how did I measure spelling? It was a spelling dictation test. Um, and the words varied in complexity from very simple words to um, more, longer and more complex words. Was it, 
Was it timed? No, it was not timed. Thank you very much for the, for, for the time of thinking. It's very clear. There's only one point I, I would hesitate to follow you. And that is, you, you, you mentioned that you think fluency seems to be working memory. And from my point of view, uh, working memory is a prerequisite one of the one of different prerequisites for fluency. So I would not, uh, not, not follow you with this. Uh, okay, well, the question is, um, I think for me and for all of us, what does fluency actually mean? And um, I think it's not, in, it's not the same as working memory, but I think there's a big overlap between fluency measures and working memory measures. Um, it's not 100%. So I think fluency is also word retrieval. Um, and uh, so, no, it's not, it's not just working memory. Um, yeah, I think the re uh, one of the variables that influences fluency, if we now think of it as a <coughs> dependent variable, would be working memory. So, in, yeah, so you're right, it comes before uh, it's involved in the production uh, of the words. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but now when you convince, can I ask you a whole wider question? Whether fluency is really related only to language, or we can speak about more, you know, some of the main general term of fluency. Uh, basically, when it was so tied into the working memory, you know, okay. Oh, okay, okay. The question is, um, is fluency a more um, domain general variable concept? In other words, um, so would you see uh, the same impact of fluency in other areas? Is that, mm -hmm. well, um, certainly, I haven't explored it, but um, you, you started me thinking about, I think in certain arithmetic calculation, I think fluency, again, because at least in part of the working memory requirements might be uh, critical. Um, and I think uh, if we look at and unfortunately, there are no good tests that I know of this. If you look at something like three-dimensional visual-spatial concepts, um, there are some of us who can do spatial rotation, but do it slowly. And I think that, that it may be um, a more general, we may have neglected the role of um, speed of processing in these other areas. So. Uh, within an individual, I think that the, uh, I don't think it is um, domain general. I think it's specific uh, to whatever cognitive process you're measuring. But um, I do think that uh, we really have ignored the role to, uh, to a large extent of fluency. <laughs>